Good morning to you hearty souls. It's good to be here with you this morning. My husband was out shoveling early so I could get out. That was nice. A um, couple note announcements, just a reminder, we do have sort of tightened COVID protocols in place for a while yet. Um, the restoration team will be meeting this week, Wednesday, Thursday, to see where we're at. Supposedly, we're peaking in this Omicron thing sometime this week. Um, and so we'll take that into account and see where we're going and how fast we drop. But I'm imagining a couple more weeks yet. But uh, not fully my decision to make, but we'll, we'll meet and you will be informed of that. The annual meeting is going to be on Zoom next week, completely on Zoom, be partly because of all this. Um, and it will be at noon. There is one service next week at 9.30. One service at 9.30 so that then we have time to get home, grab a quick bite to eat, and be ready to uh, zoom in for the annual meeting. Um, we do need a quorum of 100. It's always a little, we've always made it. We've always made it well and over, but I'm always worried every time, like what do we do if we don't have a quorum? And I go, I don't know, because we just have to have a quorum. So there is no option. We will have a quorum. Um, so please plan on that next Sunday at noon. And what else did I say? This week between services, there is a budget review up in the, the uh, Zoom room, the media room, uh, upon second floor in Reese Hall. You can go and if you have any questions about it, Pastor David will be there and help with that. And some people from the finance team also will be there to look at the budget with you. Uh, Vern Dawkins Memorial Service is this Thursday at 11 o'clock here at church. Vern passed away a couple weeks ago now, and uh, we're having a service for him Thursday. That might be all I want to say right now. I invite you to rise as we begin with words of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, <clears throat> to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. I ask that you be seated. Uh, just a reminder that we are limiting congregational singing right now. Thanks to Bonnie for leading us. Join her in your hearts as she sings. <laughs> to sing my great redeemer's prayer. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we pray. Let us pray together. Blessed Lord God, you have caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast to the hope of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. First reading for today is from the eighth chapter of Nehemiah. All the people of Israel gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. I just have to say, we think some of our lessons get long, early morning to midday, the whole dang book. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Second reading is Psalm 19, and we will read that responsibly. 
The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech. In the heavens, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts, precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward, but who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. The Holy Gospel today comes from the book of John. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the year of the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry. He has sent me to proclaim release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I've been thinking about wilderness as I prepared for today's sermon. The gospel story today comes immediately after Jesus' 40-day vision quest slash hunger strike slash temptation time with the devil in the wilderness. This experience of Jesus immediately follows his baptism in Luke's account, and it is a kind of rite of initiation. It precedes his public ministry almost as a test to see if Jesus is ready for what lies before him. 
In our modern culture, culture, few of us have had such an experience. The closest we have to it is probably our confirmation experience as youth. In the Jewish tradition, there's the bar mitzvah or the bat mitzvah for girls. And these are all symbolic coming-of-age rituals meant to carry a child through the transition into adulthood. Almost all, very huge quotation marks here, primitive cultures have such ceremonies. Maybe it's because it's an especially confusing time in life that many cultures have developed these kind of rituals. What do you do with a newly minted teenager? Somewhere I once read a quote that I recall being attributed to Maria Montessori about how the best place for teenagers is probably on the farm. Apparently, even she threw her hands in the air over this group of people. Until fairly recently, public schools gave up on trying to teach most people after about eighth grade, turning them out for the labor force, which is exactly what happened to both of my grandfathers. But to get back on course, Jesus is well past this bar mitzvah age. Presumably, he's already been through this uh, event. But following his baptism, the Spirit guides Jesus into a time in the wilderness. As I said, cultures all around the world have these boys to men traditions. A young person is left alone overnight in the wilderness or perhaps for many nights in a row. The Boy Scouts have such a tradition. These kind of rituals can serve a number of purposes and have a number of different results. One thing they can do is help the individual to develop self-confidence. In our own tradition here in America, this is often paramount. We like the idea of relying upon ourselves. It's a throwback to warrior culture, perhaps. Another thing that these traditions may do, perhaps, perhaps intentionally, is scare the crap out of the participant. The participant may or may not realize that there is a benevolent guiding hand operating behind the scenes. Will they make it through the experience? Will they overcome their fear? Will they have the self-confidence to make it through? This event, it is hoped, does not incur, occur until the benevolent leader has decided that the initiant has had sufficient training and that they may be ready for such a trial. When the participant, participant in such an event emerges from it, they are not perfected. They have survived, and all this activity merely sets the stage for the real trials that the person will encounter over the course of their life. They have been primed for the experiences that life has in store for them, hopefully with a little confidence and with a little faith. In our case for today, the benevolent leader, whom is called the Spirit, and that's with a capital S, has apparently decided that Jesus is ready for his time in the wilderness. These trials on the surface seems strange, perhaps like a hazing, and they are in a way. Hazing is a form of initiation, but often with a more malevolent flavor to it. Remember, Jesus has been led into the, into the wilderness by the Spirit, and for the sake of the record, let's just trust that this guiding force is benevolent. The same spirit that descended upon him in the Jordan following his baptism is with Jesus for the duration. At some point, the spirit is not just resting on him. It has filled him. It has become, Jesus has become one with the spirit. For Jesus, the wilderness is physically within his home territory of Galilee. Somewhere between the Jordan River, where he was baptized, and Nazareth, where he grew up. It's about a 30-mile distance. Following this wilderness experience, Jesus makes his way toward home. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he teaches in the synagogues, 
and he's well received. Reports about him begin to circulate. And as it says in verse 15, he is praised by everyone. Finally arriving home to Nazareth, he has this opportunity to teach in his home synagogue. And he reads from the book of Isaiah, announcing why he has come. In essence, Jesus announces that he has come for those who are in the wilderness. He has come for those who have not had a benevolent guiding hand. And he has come for those who have bitten the benevolent guiding hand. He has come to bring good news to the poor, to release the prisoners, to give sight to the blind, and to free the oppressed. He has come to proclaim the ignored Jewish tradition of Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor. This past week, Thirty feet north of our state's border, a family died in the wilderness. This family came from a place in the world so hot it can kill you, and yet they froze to death. Desperation leads people to make such a trip, and our world is becoming more desperate every day. This week I learned more about the path our adopted Afghan family took to become a part of our lives. As I drove Muhebala, the oldest son of the family, to a meeting. He shared with me just how, how much he missed his older brother, the person he looked to most for guidance. His brother's life is in jeopardy back in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, he is here, having a wilderness experience of his own. Muhebala told us how his father had received a middle-of-the-night phone call from his employer back in August of last year. The employer told his father to take the whole family immediately to the airport because they were unsafe. They left their home with only the clothes they were wearing. In the chaotic scene at the airport, they were able to secure a spot on a U.S. military transport plane along with 600 other people for a flight to Kuwait, then another to Spain, then one to Washington, D.C., then Indiana, and finally here to Minnesota. Jesus has come for people such as these. These people probably don't share our traditions or our religion, and our job is not to convert them. Our job is to serve them. Jesus constantly worked with outsiders. Jesus tells that if we love him, we are to feed his sheep, John 21, 17. Jesus does not tell us to convert them to our way of thinking or our way of worshiping, but to feed and clothe them. Not just this one Afghan family, not just this one family from India that died in the wilderness, but all people everywhere. Jesus has not come to serve our needs and wants. If you love me, feed my sheep. What can you and I do to make this world less a wilderness for those in need and more in line with God's intention for us? Amen.
invite you to rise as we confess together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and all places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Most gracious God, give us understanding, compassion, and respect for all people. Help us in what we say and by the way we act to witness faithfully to your unfailing love in Jesus Christ. Only you can overcome the destructive barriers that divide us. Deliver us and all people from the wrongs that continue to separate us and cause us to injure one another. Reconcile all people, bring healing, let justice and freedom flourish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the leaders of our country and those who govern other nations, O oh God, so that their decisions may protect the weak and the vulnerable, restrain those who engage in violence, and foster measures leading to an end of bloodshed, the return of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we know that with you all people find welcome and comfort and hope. We pray that you will care for the sick, the hurt in body or mind, the abused, the prisoners, the despairing, the lonely, the wandering, and the fearful. Draw near and help them as only you can. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have led us of this congregation to this place and this time in our journey of faith. We're glad to be here. We give you thanks for the blessings we have received. May our gratitude overflow in deeds of kindness toward one another and all others whom you have given us as neighbors in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, almighty God, we pray, place all for whom we pray into your eternal care through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we come to the table, we remember Jesus and how in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. As always, as we come to this table of grace, it is an invitation that Jesus gives us, and all are welcome here. Uh, the ushers will, will direct you to come forward, and just ask that you uh, stay conscious of leaving space before the people, the people in front of you space out a little bit as we come up so we don't get all bunched up. All is ready. You may come as you are directed.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Most high God, you have come among us at this table. By the Spirit's power, form us to be bearers of your word, sharing gifts of mercy and grace with all. Through Christ Jesus, our host and our guest. Amen. And now, my dear siblings in Christ, By your hands may love be shared. By your voice may peace be spoken. By your eyes may beauty be seen. By your ears may truth be heard and by your life. May the song of Christ be sung. Amen. You may be seated for the last hymn.
serve the Lord.